I'm not the sort of person who would normally make one of these critical analysis videos, but um, Mrs. Brown's Boy's Christmas Special 2020 is by far the worst thing I have ever seen. <laughs> no, I, I can't make it out. Everything looks like it's just a dead chihuahua to me. Where do I get some light? You won't need a light. Sure the sun shines out on my arse. <laughs> Don't believe your mother. Oh, hello! Now, comedy is subjective, so it's up to you to decide if this is funny or not. Certainly the studio audience, although socially distanced, seem to be laughing louder than ever. What I'd like to point out is this is the first scene in the show, and what relevance do you think this has to the plot? Well, the answer is n no relevance. None. Zero. Zilch. Nada. Nout. And season's greetings. I'll be waiting a second. I'm just going deep into the forest to check something. What the hell are you doing? Oh, Katya, good girl. Dr. Flynn is on the phone. Tell him I'll be with him in a minute. I'm just checking something for him. Now, it's not unusual to start a sitcom episode with a random scene. Something funny, a bit of witty tete-a-tete -tete or a sight gag which won't fit anywhere else. Friends, a sitcom which I still love, used to do this fairly regularly. But Mrs. Brown's Boys seems to be a collection of those scenes and nothing else. Well, I could have done without that. OK, at this point, straight after the opening sketch, most sitcom episodes would use this time to set up the main thrust of the story. Something would happen in about a minute, two minutes, you know. You'd get a letter saying your mother's coming to visit, or there's a hotel inspection, or there's a competition, or something to do with a rival company. Anything that can be developed or mined for gags. Everybody in February was raving about COVID-19. Nobody talked about the 18 COVIDs before that. <laughs> It's quickly established that this episode has something to do with the pandemic. Winnie turns up wearing a spacesuit, some jokes are made. It's established that Mrs. Brown's son and his lover are stuck in Wuhan, China, and then the subject turns to Winnie's daughter. Oh yeah, Sheridan went to see a dietitian. Oh, good for her. So, what did the dietitian say? Well, she said he said she could eat anything, anything other than tomatoes. Well, try that again. <laughs> And then there's one of these bloopers, which they always leave in, which I must admit, I do actually quite enjoy. She said, he said... <laughs> no, wait. No. <laughs> she said, he said she could eat anything except tomatoes. You're getting, you're getting, you're getting so fucking close. <laughs> <laughs> she said... Yes? He said she could eat anything... Yes? Except tomatoes. Yeah. But Sharon doesn't like tomatoes. I know, wasn't that lucky? That was two minutes of screen time. And it amounted to absolutely nothing. I mean, what would they have lost if they'd cut that out? Stuff the turkey's ash with holy Okay, the story has been established now. This show is about the pandemic. And here we are after the first scene. This should be our first plot point. If any of you are regular Mrs. Brown's viewers, you'd know that in each Christmas special there's a plot line around the tree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this tree sneezes. That's important. Remember that. That'll be back. <laughs> Hi, Miss McGill. Ah, hello, boys. Just us, ma. And me, Buster, Mrs. Brill! Now this is a running joke. These two will always turn up in every episode in a different fancy dress outfit. What are you hoping to get this Christmas, Buster? An STD. <laughs> a HDTV, Buster. Oh, thank God. That's why the Santa in the shopping centre barred me. No way! At this point in the show, they should be setting up the B story in the narrative arc. Quite often in a sitcom, they have an A story and a B story, or a subplot as it's sometimes called, and quite often they would diverge. This used to happen in Seinfeld all the time, expertly done in Seinfeld. But here's the B story. Oh, Mrs. Brown, watch out for Nicky Nacky Dicky. Oh, I heard about this. What's Nicky Nacky Dicky? Not what? Who? Yeah, there's a fella going around the estate, knocking on women's doors, but before they open the door, He's sticking his willy through the letterbox. 
<laughs> no way! Nicky Nacky Dicky. Remember that. That'll be important. <laughs> okay, now that's a callback. The Christmas tree coughed. That's to keep the Christmas tree story alive in your mind so you remember it for when there's a payoff later. But also there's a rustle at the door. Is it Nicky Nacky Dicky? <laughs> Go on, put your willy in the letterbox, I dare you. I'll bite it off. <laughs> Hello, Father. No, it's a priest and a regular character on the show. And he's got a problem. <laughs> I'm having trouble communicating with the parishioners. Oh, parishioners, yeah, yeah. When I'm trying to deliver the word of the Lord, yeah. I don't feel I'm getting the message across, and they don't listen to me. Look at that, Father. Left the price on the back of the card. How thoughtless is that? I'm sorry, what were you mumbling? But it gets swept under the carpet pretty quickly. But I cannot really get across the word. Crosswords? I love crosswords. I'm very good at them too. Now, instead of this story being built up into anything, there's instead some argument over post and then these two characters arrive. Mrs Brown? Yes? I know you booked an appointment for me to style your hair for Christmas. Yes, Friday, two o'clock. Well, Barbara's worried. And to be honest, well, she's right to... What are you saying? I'm going to do your hair here in the house. The salon is packed and we don't want to be taking any chances. Chances? You know, put you in the high risk category. All right, I'm aware that these two people are regular characters. I afraid I can't remember what their names are or their relation to Agnes Brown, but they're in it regularly. I presume they had to show their face for some reason. They've got nothing to do. Literally nothing to do. They waffle and then they leave. Because the real importance of the scene is what comes next. There was a competition that Willie had in the magazine that she said the two of us should enter for the crack. And what was it for? The BBC decided that after the Queen's Christmas message, that a member of the public should deliver a Christmas message. And whoever wins the competition gets to do it. What do you want to know? You've only won it! Fuck off! <laughs> so here's some more plot. Agnes and her neighbour, Winnie, have entered a competition, which Agnes has subsequently won. In walks her neighbour. Winnie, do you remember that competition you got us to enter? Oh, oh, the one about the Queen's yes, message. Yes, yes, Oh, I do. Yes. To be honest, Agnes, I bought 50 of them magazines <laughs> and I entered it 50 times. Yeah. Oh, that's awkward, isn't it? It turns out Winnie had her heart set on winning that competition. Agnes buckles under pressure and doesn't tell her that she is, in fact, the winner. And how are you going to tell her? I don't know. I'll think about it. Now, it's probably good at this point to just pause for a second and just recap over the stories we've got going on at the moment. There's a Nicky Nacky Dicky story, there's the coughing Christmas tree, there is the priest who's having trouble instilling enthusiasm in his congregation, and then there's also this new one, which is the competition. That's a lot of things going on at once, so what they don't want to do is waste screen time. <laughs> Do you know what I was thinking about today? What? You see them guide dogs? What about them? Well, who picks up their shit? After several old jokes, Mrs Brown manages to confess that she won the competition and Winnie hasn't. Back off, Agnes Brown. <laughs> yeah. You speech stealer! Some friend! Now this has raised the stakes because Agnes has upset her best friend. So she's going to have to work hard to repair that by the end of the episode. So in the next scene she's going to be upset, right? What do you think, Maria? Super job. Dino couldn't have done better. <laughs> well done. Hey, 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 back off the door. If there's a willy coming through that letterbox, it'll be addressed to me. Oh, this could either be a callback to the Nicky Nacky Dicky story, or it could be a payoff to the story. This story could conclude at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. Nope, it's a callback. But here's the priest again, and Agnes has an idea. You were saying that you're having a problem getting across your Christmas message. Yes. Do you have a solution? I think so. The Queen thing gave me an idea. Queen thing? Yes. 
Never mind, Father. Father, what you need to do is get a member of the community to give the sermon on Christmas Day. Great idea. But who? Well... But who indeed? It has to be somebody who's, you know, who'll be listened to, who's respected. Somebody who's, you know, pleasing to the eye. <laughs> somebody who the communicants really like. Somebody who's modest. Where's my light? Thank you. <laughs> See, I thought she was talking about Winnie, but she's clearly talking about herself, so maybe she's going to give the prize to Winnie and therefore this is going to be her own thing for her. I'm sorry, Agnes. I shouldn't have reacted the way I did. You deserve it. Oh, Winnie. How humiliating for you. Yet yeah, here's the next scene where Winnie's apologising to Mrs Brown. This should be... This is a Christmas special where, where you're supposed to feel all warm and cosy afterwards after doing virtuous things for other people. Giving it away. Oh, no, it's all about you. It's better to give than to receive. Well, you're not getting it. Can't you don't stop me now. <laughs> I'm not. They are. It was always meant that whomever gives the Christmas Day address should be resident within the Commonwealth. And then, just like that, it's taken away from both of them. You really wanted to give that speech, didn't you, Mummy? Honestly? Yes. I just thought it would cheer me up. Yeah. <laughs> But I don't know what it would have done for the Queen. Apparently that's a satisfying end to this story. Without putting any real effort in, Winnie and Agnes are friends again. So what of the priest and his sermon? What's wrong? I have a gig for Christmas Day. Really? Doing what? Father Damien's after asking me to give the Christmas sermon. <laughs> that's a great idea. Really? Really? I mean... Doesn't sound a great idea to me. So, this is Christmas 2020. I think that we can all agree that this year has been... What's the word I'm looking for? Shit! Mrs Brown wraps up this show the same way she wraps up pretty much every show, with an address to camera. And this one's clearly supposed to be the Queen's speech that she couldn't give. And she talks about the importance of comedy at these times. The statement of the bleeding obvious, which is clearly designed to tug at the heartstrings, which... I'm afraid it just does not do for me. Oh, why you look so sad. And now we're regaled with a Christmas sing-along, which it's not even a Christmas song, so God knows why this is here. This episode was supposed to have something to do with COVID, but that amounted to absolutely nothing, as did the Dicky Nicky Nacky Noodle character, which was there for two, maybe three cheap gags, and then nothing. You'd think that character would turn up or there'd be a mistaken identity or, or be revealed later on who that person is. But no, that was just abandoned, as was the Christmas tree subplot, which, you know, was just a coughing Christmas tree. Ha 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 ha. Merry Christmas. We'll stand by you. The main thrust of this episode wasn't set up until halfway through. That's the contest story. And that was resolved with pretty much no effort from Agnes. There's also the Father Damien sermon story, which again was resolved illogically with Buster giving the sermon, something which he's bound to do terrible at, and we don't even get to see that scene. We'll stand by you. Take me into your darkest hour. Story elements which are set up in the first 10 minutes are not resolved, whilst other things which are set up halfway through are resolved remarkably easily. And as a result, this episode just feels like a bag of bits, and shitty bits at that. Brendan O'Carroll seems to be given a license to do absolutely anything he wants at the BBC because of his past success, 11 million viewers in 2013, but that was seven years ago. This has got to be the worst sitcom on TV. Now you might think I'm repeating myself somewhat, but this is how the episode ends. Let me know when you're ready to go, Jimmy. It's running. Running where? The camera is running. It's recording. I oh, damn it, for God's sake, you never told me. I'm not ready. Go! It ends with Mrs. Brown giving a Christmas speech, which she already did before the sing song. But maybe she has something to add. A Christmas greeting. It was a wonderful impersonation of Olivia Coleman. <laughs> I remember some years ago, Your Majesty, when you had your anus horribles. Let's take that as a no. I'm Scott Kingsnorth, and I'm making a movie.